Nairobi, Kenya, the 1982 Marlboro Safari Rally. The greatest, the toughest motor rally in the world. I would like a win this year, the only problem is and another half a dozen people have the same idea. Favourite and the number one in the seeding is Kenyan resident Sheka Mehta, four-time winner and again driving a Datsun Violent GT, this time in brand new Marlboro livery. With their superior local knowledge, drivers from Africa have dominated the rally for three decades, overseas entrants rarely cracking their solid mastery. Mehta's teammate is Mike Kirkland, also of Kenya, in a Datsun Sylvia, seeded second of the 73 entries. Two minutes later, a third Nissan Works team entry driven by Timo Salonen of Finland joins the four-day trek. Salonen finished fourth the previous year and is looking to improve upon that. Chief threat to Nissan's defence of the title are the Works Opals driven by Rano Altonen from Finland and Walter Rohrl from Germany. Middle East driver ever to take part in the safari is Abdullah Omar of Dubai. He will be depending on the local knowledge of Kenyan co-driver Aziz Yaqub in their Marlborough sponsored Datsun Sylvia. Ahead of Omar and all the others lay 5,000 of the most demanding kilometers on earth, a marathon test of skill and endurance closely controlled by rally officials. The Marlboro Safari Rally is run each Easter weekend over a course in Kenya rimmed by Mount Kilimanjaro, Lake Victoria, Mount Kenya and the Indian Ocean. Stage one is launched from the mountain highlands of Nairobi and plummets through jungle and game land to the sea. With only brief pauses for food and rest, it clambers back from equatorial Mombasa to regain the thin, chilled air of the Kenyan capital. Rallying is not about pure speed, it is about consistent speed. That average speed is set impossibly high for the terrain and the conditions, the obstacles and obstructions. It is a question of how near a driver can approach the impossible that determines the finish order. Drivers are assessed penalty points for arriving early or late at specified points along the route. A successful driver knows when to pour on the speed to gain time to balance the sections where he will lose it. Rallies are run over public roads, subject to public laws. Alone among racing drivers, the rally entrant considers speeding tickets a hazard of the course. Most rallies have special stages, flat-out sprints designed to tear the car to tatters. The Marlboro Safari Rally is a special stage from start to finish. for the 1982 safari proved accurate on the first leg. Number four, Altanen in his Opel held the lead on the run down to Mombasa, lost it for a while to Meta, then regained it on the run back to Nairobi. Immediately behind him is number one, Sheka Meta. Even the village dogs wander out to inspect the flying Datsuns. Tony Pond of England is among the leaders, throwing his car through the unfamiliar curves as well as anyone. His performance is enhanced by the fact that he is a rookie to this event. Okay, okay. Timo Salonen, a star of the previous Marlborough Safari Rally, charged with all his skill and determination. But then braking problems on his Datsun cause him to fall back from the vanguard. Oh. 
checkpoints scattered regularly along the course determine who is doing what and where. Cars can be eliminated for not arriving within a specified time. Speed average and performance are computed and penalties levied on the basis of the flying report cards. How's it going? So many problems. Yeah? What are yeah. some of the problems? Run out of petrol just right now. <laughs> petrol, yeah? How's the car running? Okay. Okay. Porsche is a name to reckon with in any type of motor racing, and Sandro Minari of Italy is out to revive the sagging fortunes of the make in recent rallies. Plumes of dry dust are the earthen contrails of much of the first leg, but overnight rainstorms leave enough mud to bog many drivers down. Walter Rohl of Germany leading the World Rally Championship splashes through in his Opel. hovering near the lead goes through the mud with determination but also the realization that to win at rallying is to survive it is the Finn Altenen first back to Nairobi a happy beginning to his 19th safari second car on the ramp is the first seed Sheka Mehta set a record with his third consecutive safari crown a year earlier he is well placed to improve upon that record. The second leg of the safari leaves the uplands of Nairobi and climbs even higher toward Lake Victoria. Its 1,600 kilometers make it slightly shorter than the first. Artelin in Opel number four and Nissan's number one Mater continue their battle, although they're not the only drivers out at Easter. Conditions on the second leg can change as quickly as a gear shift and the constant danger of a surprise is nagging every co-driver navigating the route for his teammate. Kirkland is going well in number two, his Datsun presenting a strong threat to the leading Opel. England's Tony Pond adds to the Nissan charge. For many, the rally is already history. Almost any mechanical repair is permitted and performed en route. On a dry year such as this, axles are shattered with regularity. Tires become tissue. What is lost is time, and time is what rallying is all about. Wish you good luck. The rugged Kenyan countryside is not suited to high-speed rally cars. Most people there have never even been in a car, but have supported the safari enthusiastically for 30 years. Seeing a car blast across a simple wooden bridge designed for carts, hooves and feet is part of the constant contrast in Kenya. Altanen drives crisply and quickly to maintain his lead, determined to score his first safari win. Mater is no less precise in his driving, nor less ardent in his search for another victory. At the end, it is the home team, Meta motoring to the leader's stand at the finish of the exhausting second leg. Thank you.
Thanks, 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 yeah, everything okay. Superb, very good. But we didn't expect our axle to last through Kipkorian. Yeah, yeah. Mm. <laughs> well. We discussed it and we said we're going to break, but let's see how many we can take with us. <laughs> <laughs> yes, yes. More like that. The third and final leg of the Marlboro Safari Rally circles Mount Kenya, the highest peak in Kenya. Meta, Pond and Rural make much of the running on the third leg. The experienced Kenyan and the German world champion were expected to be at the front. But newcomer Pond is a huge surprise. Fellow rookie Abdullah Omar is still gamely competing. He was to lose a promising 17th place when East Africa proved tougher than his car. Omar was in a large majority. More than two thirds of the entries never saw the finish line. Only 21 of the 73 cars were able to complete all three stages. Near the end of 5,000 destructive kilometers, farther than London to Moscow or New York to San Francisco, the remaining drivers are still going flat out. with time well in hand is Shekhar Mehta, within sight of a phenomenal fourth consecutive triumph in the world's toughest rally. The driving performance of the rally is that of Rob Collins in what was considered an uncompetitive Kenyan-built Range Rover. Jubilation mounted in Nairobi as the cars neared. European drivers had begun to win regularly ten years earlier, after two decades of frustration. Then, Meta slammed the door on them and again made the Marlboro Safari Rally an annual victory for Kenya. Meta and co-driver Mike Doughty had suffered an incredible array of mechanical problems, yet persevered. An axle lasts a normal car a lifetime. The winning car went through seven in four days. Seven axles, seven lifetimes. Ever correct, Meta uses his turn indicator to signal his entry to victory lane. Meta has his fourth consecutive win and his fifth in the last ten years. No other driver has ever been so dominant in a World Championship rally. motorsports, the Ivory Coast Rally is about winning and losing. More than any other rally, it is also about surviving. In an average year, only one out of ten cars will be running at the end of the 5,000 punishing kilometers through the West African jungle. The 1982 event was to prove no exception to that rule. The 
Ivory Coast sits just above the equator on Africa's western horn and offers some of the most brutal racing conditions imaginable in the 12 race worldwide competition for the Rowling World Championship. A 51 car field for the 14th annual Ivory Coast Rally was led by the turbocharged Renault of France's Jean Ragnotti, both car and driver making their debut in African road racing. The focus of most attention was on Michel Mouton of France, the driving sensation of the year and a star of the first magnitude. For the first time in the history of any of motorsports world championships, a woman was in full contention for the title. She had already won three rallies during the year in her turbocharged four-wheel drive Audi Quattro in Portugal, Greece and Brazil, and her car number two was highly favored, although it was her initial campaign in Africa. Another pre-race favorite was car number three, the Toyota Salisa of Sweden's Bjorn Waldegard, a career winner of 11 events. Germany's Walter Rohrl, world champion two years earlier, was again leading the season standings and in position to capture the title if he could beat Michel Mouton. He needed a first or second to sew up the championship for his Opel Ascona. Anu Mikola of Finland shares with Valdegard the record number of 11 rally victories. A previous winner at the Ivory Coast in 1979, his mission was to boost teammate Mouton to the championship. In effect, Mikola's Audi would be a high-speed backup car tracking the championship contender for emergency repairs. Eklund of Sweden was another entrant in the strong Toyota team. The lone Lancia entered was entrusted to Italy's Andertico Budifieri, the 1980 European Rally Champion driving in Africa for the first time. A second turbocharged Renault 5 was also making its initial appearance on African dirt tracks in the hands of Bruno Sabi. The French team had months of local practice behind it in a program to adapt the turbo engines to the tropical climate. One entrant with no need for adapting to the equatorial roads and trails was Samir Assef, a native of the Ivory Coast and twice a high finisher in the rally. Assef was a valuable reinforcement to the favored Toyota team. The first leg of the rally began on the Atlantic coast in Abidjan and ended after 1,257 kilometers, only 69 of them paved, in Yamasukro. Yamasukro, home of the nation's president, was to be the center of most of the rally's activity. More than half the event was run at night to avoid the wild animals that are the normal traffic on the remote dirt roads that host most of the rally's four stages. Rally running is an exercise against the elements and against the clock. An average speed is set between two checkpoints and the teams cue as closely as possible to that theoretical pace. Penalties are assessed for arriving too early or, much more commonly, too late. Michel Mouton's co-driver, Fabrizio Pons of Italy, checks in at one of the 57 control points mandated during the course. Terrain and weather dictate the average speeds set by the organizers, and in the Ivory Coast Rally, they varied from an average of 43 kilometers an hour to 145. The 1982 event lived up to its harsh reputation right from the start, with even the leaders collecting heavy penalty times by the first control stations. Rowling is fully organized under the guidelines of FISA, governing body for all of the world's major driving championships, and campaigned around the globe wherever the topography seems too tough to traverse. In theory, one is to drive a specified distance in a specified amount of time. In practice, it is impossible. Winning is being as close to the impossible as automotive engineering, human skill, and the laws of nature allow. A car and team are monitored constantly at the control points, the standings based upon how far a team has strayed from the established speed. Michel Mouton, needing a victory to carry the championship back to France, wasted no time in going for the laurels. She opened an early lead in the first leg and began to build upon it at every control point through the low inland hills surrounding Yamasukro. Mouton's only competition appeared to be the Ivory Coast itself, no one making a dent in her runaway lead. 
Yet she was aware of the terrible attrition that claims nine out of ten cars in the West African event. Just ten years earlier, the Ivory Coast rally achieved a dubious distinction. Forty-five cars started, none finished. Every extra kilometer of speed adds to the risk of wrecking the car, but speed, along with stamina, is a good part of what victory requires. Mouton, as all other entrants, was seeking the right balance between pace and durability. Ragnotti and Renault were the main challenges to Mouton in the early going, and the crowd swelled along the route as the stage continued into its first daylight running. Sweden's Per Eklund was making the best run for the favorite Toyota team, while countryman and teammate Waldgard was close behind. Championship leader Rorrell, always within sight of his second rally crown, drove a steady, carefully judged race. Nicola continued to follow his teammate to be on hand if needed. The natural hazards of the Ivory Coast took their heaviest toll on the first leg. Of the 51 cars that started the night before, only 16 were still running at the end of the first day, and five of those straggled in after the official closing of the stage. With the bulk of the running still ahead, the field had been drastically slimmed, a normal condition for what might be the toughest rally of all. Mouton finished the initial stage one hour and ten minutes amiss of the established time, but well in advance of, in order, teammate Nicola, her main competitor Rorrell, and the early pace setter Ragnotti. All the top placings were held by factory teams, testimony to the backup crews of mechanics and wealth of spare parts. If necessary, most of the factory teams could assemble a complete new car from the spare parts, and it was often necessary. The second leg, Yamasukro to Odeon and back, 1,370 kilometers. Michel Mouton was challenging the dictum that no one wins their first African rally. The four-wheel drive Quattro, designed with rallying in mind, had an apparent edge in traction and handling over the normal two-wheel drive machines. Yet ahead of her on the second stage lay a corrugated landscape just waiting to tear a car apart, regardless of how many wheels were putting down the power. The second stage began at two in the morning, heading through the night toward the northwest corner of the country. Nicola followed his team leader, always ready to help. Rural was having trouble with a shock absorber, costing him precious penalty time. Ragnotti would soon be out with a broken steering column, snapped as he landed badly from a jump. is a persistent myth that the car tearing around a rally circuit is the same as one available at the local car dealership. Outwardly, they are identical, but inside they are all racing machines. Anything not essential to pure speed is eliminated, anything not resistant to breakdown is replaced. To the consternation of Walter Rorrell at one control point, a non-essential component appeared to be his starter. 
Willing hands gave him a push, and he was off again in pursuit of Mademoiselle Mouton. The race leader led the survivors through some of the lushest country on earth. The Ivory Coast produces more cacao, the basis of chocolate and cocoa, than any other country in the world and is a leader in the production of yams, coffee, and palm products, most of which are exported to Europe and the United States. The imported cars and rally teams were the center of West African attention at the end of October, and the drivers had no time for anything but the road immediately ahead. Mouton opened an awesome lead in the second leg, almost an hour ahead of Rural and two hours in advance of anyone else as they returned to Yamasukro. Rural was now in second place, good enough to seal his championship if he held it through the final two stages. Eklund and his Toyota were third, more than an hour behind the German in penalty time. Sabi was two places back in the lone remaining Renault. Third and longest leg of the rally, 1,713 kilometers, is traditionally the make or break point of the contest. It is an exercise in flat out driving over tricky jungle paths. Only 11 cars were still in the running, with Mouton still leading and the more experienced Rural pressing her and hoping for a mistake. As everyone else, Mouton was having her share of mechanical problems, and her crew had to be prepared to repair anything, anywhere, at any time. The lady driver expressed her satisfaction with the first two stages of the rally. It was uh, going well because we have one, one hour in front, so... We change only by security, we change only the different, real differential, but now it's uh, everything okay, except now we change the water uh, cooler. She also voiced her happiness with the Audi Quattro. Oh, the car no problem at all, you know. Uh, it, it's still very long, but uh, for the moment the car is okay. Optimism is a rare quality in a rally driver, and Michel Mouton's proved to be premature. Her German mechanics were rebuilding the car from the inside out, and very little remained of the components she had left Abidjan with. The third leg was a severe trial for the leader, the Audi losing an hour to the competition as Mouton drove 80 kilometers with a broken drive shaft. She continued to hold a slim lead over Roro, followed by Edmund, Waldegard, and Sabi. In spite of repeated mechanical failures, all 11 third stage starters made it through the beautiful Thai forest and to the end of the lake. The fourth and final leg was a relatively simple 661 kilometer dash from up country in Yamasukro back to the capital of Abidjan. Everything went right for Rural on the fourth leg and everything went wrong for Mouton. The German was suddenly in the lead when Mouton overturned her car only 18 kilometers into the final leg. Her challenge for the rally and the world championship had turned upside down. Rural had no competition as he drove into Abidjan and into the record books with a victory in a race he candidly disliked. The world champion labeled the Ivory Coast contest the roughest on the calendar and competed only to protect his title hopes. The 1982 World Rally Driving Champion and co-driver Christian Giesthofer had taken the crown the way it should be won, with a convincing victory. It was a triumph of tactics, technology, and experience. Rural had raced the equivalent of twice around the globe in becoming the first to ever win the rally driving title twice. He knew it would be just as punishing to defend it the following season, and there would always be a lady in waiting. Kenya is the cradle of civilization. 
It can also be the end of championship ambitions for rally drivers without extraordinary endurance and tenacity. The Marlborough Safari Rally, staged every Easter in Kenya, is simply the greatest test of car and driver in the world. As with the country's celebrated big game, it is a matter of the survival of the swiftest and the fittest. The Marlborough Safari is one long, natural, unrelenting, unforgiving, unforgettable open road achievement of the impossible, and has become as much a part of the East African nation's heritage as its wildlife, its mountains, its jungles, its rift valleys. Archaeologists consider Kenya among the most ancient lands on earth. Rally drivers deem it among the most challenging. The high national esteem of the safari is underlined by the official presence of Kenyan President Daniel Arap Moy, sending the cars off in the 31st running of the rally in 1983. Local media coverage reached the very few Kenyans who did not actually witness part of the event. For five days, the press will report little else. The first car to tackle the treacherous 5,000 kilometers across equatorial Africa is fittingly the first lady of rallying, Michelle Mouton, Never France. Never think about this, because it, everything can happen each, each kilometer, and everything can change each kilometer. More than a match for the men in the sport, Mouton was barely beaten for the world championship the previous season. But more. Number two is Ari Vatanen of Finland, in one of the two Opel Asconas entered. It's impossible to plan. One of the quickest in the sport, Vatanen is returning to full-time rallying after sitting out the latter part of last year's championship. Timo Salonen, another of the Finnish drivers dominating rally driving, is third to be flagged off in one of the three Nissans. Yes, in a manner... Sheka Mehta, more than anyone else, is synonymous with success in the safari rally. If we spend more time repairing... The Kenya resident has won the event five times in all, including the last four in a row, and is favoured to add to that impressive record in his factory-supported Nissan, carrying the Marlborough colours. Mike Kirkland, in car number five, is another local favourite in the third works Nissan. Finland's Hannu Mikola, in car number six, is Michel Mouton's teammate in the Audi Quattro team and renowned as one of rallying's great all-round drivers. Local hero, Vic Preston Jr., who has considerable experience on Kenyan roads, completes the Audi lineup. I'm very happy on the car. Abdallah Omar of Dubai, a leading rally driver in the Middle East, is back for his second Marlborough Safari attempt in car number 24. The first leg of the rally, staged every year at Easter, runs from the capital of Nairobi to Mombasa on the sea and back, a flat-out dash of 1,600 kilometers. The unyielding Kenyan countryside is the constant of the rally. The variable hazard is the weather. In 1983, Easter fell early, before the traditional season of long rains and their resulting mud. This means clogging, clinging, blinding dust. Every car leaves its own blizzard of fine, dense dust in its wake, making overtaking another car at best risky and at worst impossible. At first, the order follows the progression of the seeding, with the factory entries, the lowest numbers of the 78 starters, well out in front. The heat and dust take their toll. Tires begin to blister, water and oil temperatures soar over the top, brake and clutch fluid begin to boil. Yet the drivers press on, at some stages required to maintain average speeds of 175 kilometers per hour. The smallest measure of time in the Marlborough Safari is the minute. The milliseconds used to determine positions in traditional European rallies have no place in an event where those who finish can be separated by a day in penalty time. 
Most rallies include special stages, speed sprints over closed roads to add obstacles to the course, like a steeplechase. No artificial difficulties are needed in the safari. Nature supplies enough. To assist engine cooling, many drivers switch on the car heaters in spite of the heat from the equatorial sun. With the windows closed to pressurize against the pervasive dust, conditions inside the cars go from uncomfortable to intolerable. While the rally is near torture for the drivers and their support crews, it is an eagerly anticipated holiday for the Kenyan natives. Every year, the bulk of the 1983 entries are private, but the front runners are factory teams. Audi, competing in the Marlborough Safari for the first time, came with the planning and logistical support of a military campaign. In addition to the three rally cars, the team arrived with three practice vehicles, three four-wheel drive cars, six Volkswagen buses, four retrieval cars, a helicopter and a light aircraft. Nissan and Opel appeared with similar armadas. As expected, the top seeds, Mouton, Vatanen, Salonen, Meta, Mikola and Preston set the early pace. teams clock in at the 26 control points on the first leg, penalties for arriving late or early begin to mount. Several arrive early by design, hoping that moving to the head of the pack and out of the blinding dust of back markers will offset the penalty. Hanu Mikola took the lead at the outset. The Audi trio is well placed, Vic Preston and Michel Mouton high in the standings. Preston is a logical favourite for the finish line honours, knowing the roads of his country as well as anyone. Audi shipped him a practice car in January, and he has logged thousands of kilometres over the rally legs in the months since. The Quattros, thought to favour damp going, were thriving in the dry. Preston was the man to beat, on his native turf with a powerful, proven car. Even the strongest car and driver needs rest and refitting frequently in what is essentially five days and nights of racing. Michel Mouton and co-driver Fabrizio Pons of Italy are having their first look at East Africa, and they have a front seat to view it. Supremely competitive, Mouton and Pons drive every race to win, rather than adopt a slower but safer pace favoured by many others to finish and score championship points. Rally cars break down because they are subjected to more punishment in a few days than a family sedan in a lifetime. What is remarkable is the speed with which the service crews have the cars repaired and back in contention. Their speed would be exceptional in a workshop, 
In remote jungles and mountains, it is astonishing. Muto has had her share of accidents that are the stock of the trade, but nothing has blunted her enthusiasm. and the lead to Timo Salonen, who lost his gearbox in the lead to Shekometa, hoping for his sixth victory. But it was not to be. At the final stage of the first leg, Meta snapped a camshaft within sight of the finish. Mechanics slogged to repair it, but there was just not enough time. Uh, we broke a camshaft uh, about 30 kilometers before the last control, and um, we're time barred because it's too big a job to fix it. After a total of 17,175 kilometers as reigning champion of the event, Meta's incredible run of safari victories has come to an end. At the finish of the first leg, Vic Preston Jr. is in the lead. Second is Timo Salonen, third Michel Mouton, fourth Rob Collinge, fifth Rono Altonen and sixth Ari Vatanen. First in and first out for the second leg is Preston, son of the 1955 safari winner. With one second and two third place finishes in the rally to his credit, he seems destined to continue the family tradition in the third works quattro. Timo Salonen in car number three lies second and the sole hope of the Nissan team. Their other two cars already casualties. With a service fleet of 20 cars and trucks backing him up, Salonen can expect a lot of support from the Japanese factory. Michel Mouton in car number one has worked her way back to third after a 42-minute stop to repair suspension damage on the first leg. Her rise in international rallying has been as swift as her driving. Only two seasons earlier, the lady from Grasse in southern France was driving a semi-official Fiat in minor European events. In 1982, she proved she was ready for the major league by winning more international rallies than anyone else and narrowly missing the world championship for drivers. Mikola, in car number six, has also sprung back from first leg disasters requiring installation of a new water pump and cylinder head. Nighttime starts and finishes are as common to rallying as punctured tires. In many major rallies, more than half the driving takes place at night, adding a lack of sleep to other hazards. Ari Vattenen, in car number two, is almost a half hour off Vic Preston's pace, but there are still two legs to go. The second leg is a circuit through the wheat fields ringing Mount Kenya, highest point in the land. Dust is again the diet generated in infinite quantities by anything that moves, and there are still a lot of things moving as the second leg unfolds. It develops into a procession, with only minor shuffling, mainly due to tyre failure from racing on and off the road.
Flying stops at control points save minutes, the most precious commodity to a safari driver. The teams speed on, relentlessly pushing even farther the cars that have already reached the limit. After circling Mount Kenya, 36 of the 78 starters are still in the running after 3,000 kilometers of tough going. There are still 2,000 left to go. In three decades, the Kenyans have become sophisticated in their knowledge that it takes a special driver to master their rally. The question becomes whether it will be yet again a Kenyan, like the leading Preston, or one of the more experienced Europeans who are chasing him. of tactics as well as speed appear to loom for the third leg after a rather cautious second. Vic Preston has not only retained his lead in the Audi Quattro, he has extended it. He would again be ahead of the dust storm for the third and final leg and that was the key to his success in the second. Preston, Salonen and Mouton were again one, two and three. Altonen had moved up to fourth, followed by Collinge, five, and Mikola, six. Hanu Mikola, after another series of repairs, was again working his way up and illustrating why in 1972 he was the first overseas driver ever to win the safari. Michel Mouton, lying just off the pace, was in the third works Audi capable of winning. Her flair and determination are outstanding to the public and press. She gives everything she's got in every event, compressing as much effort into one rally as some drivers would over a season. Mouton accepts nothing but the best. When congratulated for second in the 1982 championship, she pointed out that there was still one position higher. <laughs> Rally fever went up a degree with the approach of the final leg. Kenyan press and broadcast coverage was absolute and totally professional. Is the third attempt of the team of Salonen. Uh, that's the crew that are still in the rally. Mike Kaplan is out. The third and final leg is a climb from the highlands of Nairobi up to the shores of Lake Victoria and back. It starts just before dawn, and like the earlier going, is a dust bowl, stretching from Preston in the lead back to the last stragglers hours behind. The dust added another hazard to an already risky undertaking. Hanu Mikola likened overtaking a competitor in the dust to landing an airplane blind with only instructions from the control tower. Finding a clear view through the dust dictates a different track for vehicles hurtling through the same narrow stretch. In the desperation of the final stage, overtaking has become critical, taking out a number of well-placed challenges. Preston still leads, but a broken turbocharger cuts his advantage severely. was again up to second place when she lost a rear wheel for the second time in the rally. The crowd sense the battle has been joined and the rally outcome is developing in the final stages. Little separates the leaders and it could be the closest safari finish since 1973 when the event ended in a tie. Salomon in the Nissan number three, 
Mikola in the Quattro No. 6, and Vatanen in the works Opel Ascona No. 2 threaten to make it a three-way finish fight to the winning post. Preston holds on to the honours, but his long stop for repairs has forced him to abandon the tactics that served him so well. Instead of driving at his own pace, he must go flat out to keep ahead of the fast-closing competition. Later, a rock hidden in the flying dust would eliminate his suspension and his victory hopes only 25 kilometers from the winner's podium. Mikola checks in and once again reinforces his reputation for performing brilliantly in adverse conditions. Salomon has been in the thick of things from the start and stands ready to inherit the lead again should the others falter. Factory teams still lead the long train back to Nairobi. Their ranks are rapidly thinning. Of the eight works cars at the start, only three remain. Nicola and Mouton continue in the two remaining quattros, Vattenen in the sole opal. Nissan, so successful in the past with the Datsun Silvia model, have been suffering tremendous development problems with their new model, the 240 RS. Every factory team is aware that, in spite of enormous preparation and organization, there is always the chance of being beaten by some unknown entry. It is highly improbable, but on safari, rallying is a string of improbabilities. Drivers face new problems at this late stage of a rally. Fatigue, lapses of concentration, sagging of the will to win. The Nakuru control is the final halt of the rally and finds Finland's Ari Vatanen and co-driver Terry Harriman of Northern Ireland carrying the honours. The lead has changed six times, but their possession of the number one slot could prove the most significant. Mikola arrives seven minutes later, after 4,787 kilometres of hard competition. The only remaining question in the final rundown to the finish is whether the Opel can hang on to the lead over the power and traction of the Audi. Vattenen stays clear of Mikola and his Quattro in an inspired duel to Nairobi and the final clocking of the contest. Nairobi is on hand to welcome the victors. Ari Vatanen drove a fast, well-judged race to snatch the lead at exactly the right time and hold on to it. The Finnish champion is the first to mount the ramp which he left 5,000 grueling kilometers earlier winning in only his second attempt at the safari. Vattenen was six minutes ahead of countryman Hanno Mikola, a blink of an elephant's eye in such a long and impossible test. But that blink was enough to make Ari Vattenen and Terry Harriman the undisputed champions of the world's toughest and greatest motor rally. Hanu Mikola, beset by mechanical failures, yet not knowing how to give up, brought more glory to himself and the Audi team. A second place by six minutes in Audi's first East African entry points to the power of the future. Audi's encouraging debut is amplified by Michelle Mouton, a strong third in her first visit to Kenya. 
It was a performance that endorsed her reputation as a driver who can excel in any climate or on any surface, and the Quattro's potential to do anything, anywhere. provide the pyrotechnics of the Marlborough Safari, while private entries are the heart. A typical example is Kenyan Johnny Hillier, who started seventh in a Peugeot 504 pickup and dropped only one place to the end, driving ably and out of the glare of the international press. With sportsmen like Hellier, challenging the stars like Battenham, Mikola and Mouton, there will always be a Marlborough Safari rally, and there will always be an exciting one. Thank you.